Welcome to the Board of Education's board meeting. May I have a motion to go into closed session? I move that we go into closed session. Second. Taryn. Oh, call to order. Sorry. I move that we go into closed session to discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom this public body has jurisdiction, any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals to perform administrative functions and to consult with counsel. Second. Second. <laughs> So we will close the um, open part of the session to go into closed session. We'll see you back at 6 p.m. Ladies and gentlemen, if we could get the meeting started at this time, please. Ready? Mm -hmm. Welcome to the January 10th Board of Education meeting. This is a public meeting that is being videotaped for county citizens to review on QAC-TV 7, a local cable station. The agenda is available on the table at the door. Um, during this meeting, we ask that you turn off your cell phones and hold personal conversations outside the meeting room. We will now stand and repeat the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. May I have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. May I have a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. Uh, approval of the minutes for open and closed sessions, December 6th and the 20th. May I have a motion to approve the minutes from December 6th, uh, December 6th and December 20th? So, so moved. moved. May I have a second? All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. The ayes have it. Dr. Kane, would you like to lead us through the recognitions for this evening? Absolutely. It is a pleasure. <coughs> Just go on down. Ready? <coughs> Let me walk by before I trip them. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Good evening. I guess I'm on. We have four awards tonight. We have four recognitions. And first of all, I'd like to express my appreciation and thanks for the efforts of all of our students and our staff. But we'll start with the Energizer Bunny. So would you please come forward? Our Energizer Bunny awarders. So the Energizer Bunny Award recipient this month is Miss Lynn Lineman and she is the school counselor at Centerville Middle School. She coordinated the efforts of Centerville Middle, Middle School to support the hurricane victims in Texas, Florida, and Puerto Rico. Two van loads of pet supplies, baby items, and assorted toiletries were sent to families in Texas and Florida. Ms. Linneman remained after school several nights to gather and pack these items. Over $500 in coins were collected for the victims of Puerto Rico. We truly appreciate Ms. Linneman's efforts, and we feel that she is very deserving of the Energizer Bunny Award. Continue to blaze the trail at Centerville Middle School, and thank you, Ms. Linneman, for all that you do. Won't you please come forward? And, and Ms. Linneman, you have some friends with you, so won't we have them, you introduce them and come forward? <laughs> <laughs> and we have principal, Mr. Dunn, to support Ms. Lenneman. Thank you very much. I'm going to switch sides with you. Ms. Hardlow is a little Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Next, we will award our Shining Star Award recipient. So on behalf of the entire Queen Anne's County Public Schools and Suttlersville Elementary School staff, it is my honor and my privilege to award Mr. Doran Phillips, known by everyone at um, Suttlersville Elementary School as Mr. Monty. Mr. Monty, he gets the Shining Star Award. His official job title at, uh, Sut at I'm sorry, Suttlersville Elementary is custodian. He is so much more, much more to the students, much more to the staff, and much more to the parents. He spends every single minute of his day making the building shine and doing whatever needs to be done to make Suttlersville Elementary School a better place. In addition to shining the walls, the halls, the floors, and the doors, he's constantly shining the minds of many of the students. He's a mentor to several students, and Mr. Monty even uses his personal break time to work with a couple of students who are having some difficulties in math. Thank you for that, Mr. Monty. These students look forward to working with Mr. Monty, and the teachers and staff truly see him as someone who has the ability to provide meaningful and purposeful math lessons lessons as well as real life lessons. Mr. Monty is truly a big reason to the overall um, <coughs> success of Suttlersville Elementary School and why the building shines on so many levels. So congratulations Mr. Monty for being one of Queen Anne's Public School's finest. Please come forward and keep shining. <laughs> And Mr. Gotcha. Monty, you have some friends and family here with you. Won't you call them forward and introduce them? Thank you for everything. <laughs> <laughs> nice to meet you. Okay, and this is Dor you are beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Next is our Hero Award. The Hero Award is given to Dylan Simpler. Dylan is a third grader who attends Sellersville Elementary School. He was nominated by Miss. She, I apologize. <laughs> she was nominated by Mrs. Bildstein. Is it Bildstein or Bildstein? Bildstein. Dylan is a student of great character. She demonstrates kindness, inclusion of others, fairness, acceptance of others' differences, and respect toward all. She displays courage in standing up for others. Recently at lunch, Dylan heard one of her classmates say something mean to another classmate. Sometimes that happens, even here. Uh, <laughs> Dylan told the first class classmate to stop being mean. She then reminded him that he would not like it if someone spoke like that to him. So congratulations to Dylan. We're so proud of you and continue to be Queen Anne's County hero. So come on forward. Oh, mama, we got lots of goodies for you, Dylan. So first you get a medal, so ready, and then you get a nice little bracelet. That's a hero bracelet and a certificate. Congratulations. And Jimmy, you have some family members and folks here for you, so why don't you have them come on up and tell us who they are? <laughs> who, who do you have here with you, Dylan? My mom and dad. Your mom and your dad <laughs> and your principal. Okay, great. Nice to meet you.
And last but not least, we have our Difference Maker Award recipient. This month, the Difference Maker Award is given to Miss Jennifer Boulay. She's a teacher at Sudlersville Elementary School, and Ms. Boulay received 10 nominations from students. They spoke very highly of Ms. Boulay being an inspiration to them and being a great teacher who makes learning fun. One student stated, Ms. Boulay is always fair. When I first came to this class, no one picked me for the morning game, but you wanted me to get picked. I was happy. I thought you were the best teacher ever, and then you helped me when I needed help in reading. You're like a second mom to me. The ultimate compliment, my, my. Next, you make uh, school fun when we write, and you turn on music when we're done. You're loving and caring to everybody. Miss Boulay, thank you for being a difference maker in the lives of our children. It's teachers like you who go above and beyond the call of duty to ensure our students are getting the assistance they need to obtain academic success and, I dare say, love. So congratulations, Ms. Boulay. Please come forward. Thank and we've you. got some other goodies. Who do you have with you, Ms. Boulay? Uh, my husband, Rick, and my daughter, Isabel. All right, come on forward. <laughs> and Mr. Walls. Thank you so much. Come on, Mr. Walls. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, yep. <laughs> uh, before we move on to the community um, involvement, um, we have someone else that we would like to thank. We gotta get his attention now. Mr. Sid Pender, this board would like to commend and thank you for the god awful last 10 days that you've had. <laughs> <laughs> and what a wonderful job you have done. It's not an easy job. It's not an easy job. Thank you, Don. Okay, um, at this time we're going to board members um, highlight any community involvement over the past month. I don't know where we started. <laughs> Carrie, why don't we start with you, being you're new here. Oh, community <laughs> involvement, okay. Um, wow, so that was December, and my daughters are playing basketball. So um, December 9th, I went to a basketball game at Stevensville Middle. December 12th, I was at the winter concert at Kennard Elementary School. Uh, the 16th, basketball game, Stevensville Middle. Um, 19th, Holiday Concert, Queen Anne's County High School, the Centerville Middle School performed there. Um, December 20th, Centerville Middle School Choir at Queen Anne's County High School. December 22nd, I had the opportunity to go to the Board of Ed Christmas lunch, and that was fun. Um, they did a great ugly sweater contest. <laughs> uh, December 22nd, I went to... Um, a holiday party uh, that was in uh, a teacher's classroom, Justin uh, Crew um, hosted it, and it was wonderful. Um, December, no, I'm into January. January 6th, um, basketball games, Stevensville Middle School, basketball games, Centerville Middle School, and then basketball game, <laughs> Mattapique Middle School, and we lost all of them. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but it was great to go to the different um, schools, and good month, very active month. So. <laughs> Um, I didn't document every date. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Chad, why not? Um, I did uh, do the Centerville um, uh, band concert, the Christmas concert, um, the parade. I, w I was there. <laughs> um, 
Oh, that's um, right. We were at the Christmas parade. Yeah. Cool. Um, helped with multiple um, Christmas drives for needy children. Um, and that's it. It seems like a blur. It seems like I mean, December was ago. eons ago. Yeah. It does. Captain Kelly? Um, I did attend the uh, retiree holiday luncheon. That was a really nice event. Um, they had a lot of fun there. And it is kind of fun to see all the all the um, you know retired teachers and it's, it seems like a good organization and they're still helping the students even after they've been um, been retired. They they're all very seem to be very active in the school still, which is great to have that resource. <coughs> um, and then the uh, legislative luncheon for uh, MABE is going to be February 20th. And it is an event that usually the entire board would try to attend. Together, you end up getting at a, in the state house, you sit at a, um, a table all together and our delegation comes in, sits with us. And what that gives us an opportunity to talk with them about our concerns um, for Queen Anne's County education and what other kinds of things that we would like them to try to advocate for us with the General Assembly. So I really recommend we all try to go to that. Um, it's, a, it's a nice event. And uh, usually the superintendent comes too, and I imagine you're interested in coming. Um, and the other thing is, um, the just to let you know, the MABE uh, had a meeting, um, and they just kind of, it was a blur because they basi basically they're going to, they're following over 400 bills going into the um, assembly this year. So as we are successful or not successful with them, I will try to report back to you all when, when it starts getting active. Can't, I can't remember the actual date the assembly starts. Do you remember? T today. Uh, yeah, today. it started today. Today. Okay, so today it started. Mm -hmm. So they are advocating <coughs> MABE is for, for all of our school systems in Maryland um, as best they can, and that's a lot of bills to follow. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's it. Um, I was fortunate enough to receive NARCON training this month, and um, Anyone who has the opportunity, I highly recommend you do so. Uh, my training program included hands-on um, use of the product and the parameters involved. And I have a kit that I carry in the event that unfortunately I come across an emergency where I would need it. So I was very, very delighted to be able to do that. Um, I was able to also attend the Multicultural Proficiency Committee luncheon and meeting. Um, that is a wonderful organization that is trying to do great things in this county with our student body, our school system, some of the local management board and other organizations in this community, and anybody who has the desire to learn more about our proficiency committee, I recommend you come to a meeting. Everyone's welcome. And um, we have some extremely dedicated community leaders involved. Brad Engel is a part of it from our organization. And I can't say enough about that program. And then the flu hit me. And today is the first day I've been out of my house since the Friday before Christmas. No, I'm sorry. since. Um, took the 23rd because it came to my attention through Annette that many children in our community had been missed by the adopt bear program. So Mrs. DiMaggio took it upon herself to see to it that 52 additional families and children were adopted by her friends, her family, anyone who was willing to step to the plate and I was delighted to be one of those people. Thank you. Sharon. Thank you for asking me. Thank you. And Sharon became a grandmom again. I became a grandmom again in <laughs> December. Right. Yes, I have grandbaby number five. And of course, she's beautiful. And, um, <laughs> and she really is. <laughs> my daughter is on maternity leave from our school system, but will be back early in February and can't wait to get back to her students who are missing her too. So she's very dedicated, just as all of us are. Congratulations. Thank you. I really don't have much to say, Sharon. <laughs> Sharon kind of summed it up well, for me. We you know, had, once, once, it got, once I got sick, that was it. Everything came to a standstill. <laughs> so it didn't matter what was on my schedule. It wasn't going to happen. It was bad. But we did, um, North County, um, we did have 52 children that um, possibly would have probably not had a Christmas um, 
and the network that I have. And we got together and we had all 52 of those uh, children a Christmas by Saturday. <laughs> and uh, 33 families that we made sure had enough food for a month, believe me. Um, so I missed all my Christmas programs at the schools this year, and which made me sad, but I was very, very busy doing that and just didn't have time. So, um, but it was a wonderful holiday season, and so, so thank you. I would just like to add that Annette put this out to all of um, the community members that she had contact with, and within two days, because I even went back to her and said, I can take another one, she said, I have every one of them covered. So that says something about our community and how we step up to an emergency situation and take care of our own. Absolutely. Thank and you. thank you. Well, it's my pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> it's your life's work. You're yeah, so that's good right. That. Yes. All right, we'll turn it over to you, Dr. Kane. Well, I am just blessed to be a part of the community, so thank you all for what you've done. Uh, we uh, at Central Office also were co contributed to Adopt a Bear um, so in the month of December. So we also... Um, <laughs> Spend time in schools. We continue to do our SLO visits with principals uh, throughout the month of December. We had an opportunity to meet with um, Mr. Peluski and Mr. Pender and I to meet with uh, Barrett Commander for State Troopers, State, State Police, Lieutenant uh, Conley. And he came out to visit with our principals today, always offering us uh, their support in, um, and tips in keeping our schools safe. So that was great that he was able to spend some time with us. Uh, Mr. Peluski and I uh, went down to Herndon, Virginia, and we met with uh, some folks that have an online um, academy. So we are gathering some information so that we can share with you and how, how Queen Anne's County can, uh, can benefit and, and our residents, possibly, who are not part of our school system right now. So we may be able to present some information that will be beneficial to a lot of families. So we're looking forward to that. Of course, I was uh, uh, here for the winter luncheon and that was wonderful it was good to participate in the ugly sweater contest and just have a lot of fun the gift exchange that was kind of fun I do believe they set me up uh, but it was a lot of fun so thanks for that the new girl on the yes job. and I told them I said oh this is the new girl thing, yeah right? I got it but it was so much fun thank you Sorry I that. Yeah. Mr. Peluski uh, I do not. Many of the many of the things that I was going to suggest were we the same things that, uh, <laughs> that Dr. Kane had traveled with her quite a bit. So uh, I do not have anything at this time. Pretty much the same thing that uh, Dr. Kane was saying, and I did want to take this minute just to uh, thank the bus drivers and the maintenance department and the custodians for the past ten days, um, especially Margaret Ellen uh, Kalvinovich, Jim O'Donnell, and David Carter, because. They're really working around the clock to make sure that the buildings aren't freezing, um, pipes aren't bursting. Knock on wood, we've been very fortunate, and um, I just wanted to give a little plug to them and say thank you. Absolutely. So it's been a busy two, two weeks, not <laughs> going anywhere besides the school and uh, riding the road, so. Yeah. <laughs> well, we thank you. Thank you. Mr. Farley? Only to add that I recently, whoa. <laughs> I recently had the opportunity to visit with Mabe, and I want to thank them for helping us prepare for what is clearly an upcoming and busy legislative session, which we will keep you uh, aware of uh, as we have some potential fiscal impact. Thank you. This is Lane Graft. Just again, I'm just repeating, you know, spending a lot of time with the, the holidays and whatnot and participating in the Adopt the Bear program. And and Mrs. Landgraft is also a new grandmother. <laughs> or not new, but a new grandbaby. <laughs> three, maybe. Congratulations, Congratulations on that. For Christmas, so that was very good to Yes. Nice. Awesome. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, we will move on to the student board members. And uh, Sarah, Queen East County High School, is out this evening. She had to be at... Um, the play um, because it misses so much time she had to be out so but we had lovely grace mm -hmm. okay so at Kent Island High School today and tomorrow we are finishing up park testing um, we have our student of the month ceremony on January 19th on January 22nd we are hosting a scheduling night for rising ninth graders and their families to prepare them for the next school year 
Our first semester ends with final exams on January 24th and 25th, and the second semester will begin on January 30th. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Sharon? Yes. So at this time, we're going to go into our community comments, and we invite anybody who wishes to speak. Please keep in mind that we have some guidelines, and speakers should sign the roster at the door, which I have in my hand now. But if you've not signed the roster, we'll call you up anyway. Comments should be limited to two minutes in, two minutes in length, and anything above two minutes should be submitted in writing. Questions or statements to the board should relate to a recent agenda item, an agenda item that is expected to appear in the future, or a matter of general policy over which the board has authority. Please do not discuss items related to negotiations. Those items are to be discussed at the bargaining table. This is not a proper avenue to address specific student or employee personnel matters, especially those matters on a legal appeal to the board. Comments about the, ad comments about the actions or statements of the individual staff members are not appropriate for public comment and should be referred to the superintendent of schools or processed through available channels. Citizens' participation is not intended to be a question and answer session. If you have specific questions for the board, we will make sure that an appropriate staff member responds to your questions at a later date. The board respects your desire and your right to convey your message freely, but asks as a courtesy to the board and our citizens that you respect the board's request to refrain from naming citizens and name calling when offering your critique. The first member, the first community person that we have signed up to speak is Joel Strobeck. I sit in this chair. You can. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. And I talk into the mic. I'm yes. already wired. Yes. Okay. Great. That mic is on. Um, members of the board, uh, support personnel, and Dr. Kane. Uh, my name is Steve Strobeck. I retired in 1992 after 26 years of classroom teaching in Queen Anne's County schools. On behalf of the retired teachers of Queen Anne's County, I would like to thank you for your past support as regards funding for our health benefits. We came into this profession to serve. And in return, the county made promises to provide a level of support in our old age when we could no longer work. To this point, the county has honored these promises, even in the face of challenging budgets. And it is the hope of all of us that this support can be maintained going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Next on the list is Mr. Richard McNeil. I got uh, one minute and 57 seconds. 58. Good evening. Uh, Richard McNeil, and I'm president of the Retired Educators Group. Uh, one of my hats, and that's what I'm here tonight for. I um, want to uh, let you know and, and thank uh, Captain Kelly. She was able to join us for our December meeting at the luncheon. Uh, we took account of how many years service was in the room, and it was, came out to a little over 1,400. It was 1,404 years of service with just the people who were at lunch there. And it was great to see the, uh, the fellowship at the time together, sharing pictures of grandchildren and all like that. We also collect volunteer hours uh, half the year from July 1 to the end of December, and then we do that again. And for volunteer hours in this fall, we had 1,124 volunteer hours. So a lot of our retirees are not sitting at home doing nothing, if you will. They're giving back. Many of these volunteer hours are in the schools in this county. Uh, they also are represent some going to nursing homes and so forth, but a lot of that is right there. To take that a little bit more, that was from only 15 members. So 15 members out of the 49 that we had there for the luncheon gave us that 1,100 hours. So they, they've been real busy folks. Um, as Steve said, uh, we, th we thank you for your support on the, on the health care package primarily, and uh, we appreciate um, your consideration of continuing that, especially when budgets get real tight. Um, Steve is also a real important uh, cog in our membership. He <coughs> represents our group at the legislative conference. Uh, which is underway. And um, one of the things that I uh, read in the Baltimore Sun recently 
was that the casinos set a record of, uh, if I got it right, $142 million in the month of December. And in that, it also stated again that a big chunk of that is to go to an educational fund. Now, when I was at a state meeting last fall, I raised that question as to who's monitoring that and who's seeing that. And a lady from the state um, finance group hemmed and hauled and finally said, well, it just goes into the general fund to which there is, in my mind, very little accountability for that. Now, I'm encouraging uh, Dr. Kane and your group and the boards of education all over to start asking questions. Where is this money that was designated, 60% of which, when it was voted in by Governor O'Malley, and he, not he voted it in, but he pushed for that to be passed, 60% of that was supposed to go to an educational fund to upgrade technology in schools, to upgrade communication within schools, and for early childhood programs. Now, I re very distinctly remember that. I don't see the money going anywhere that way. And I would encourage local boards, organizations on maybe your part would get a better answer. Um, I don't know. Um, anyway, uh, it's a lot of money out there that should be supporting our children across this state. Our next meeting is March 13th. We'll be having a luncheon and a meeting right here in the boardroom. If, if any of you are in the area and, and want to join us, if you'll let Jackie know by the Thursday before so we can have a count, we do have it catered, uh, you're welcome to join us on that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else at this time who would like to speak? If not, we'll close press and public comments. And we'll move on to Dr. King um, introducing the presentations for this evening. Absolutely. Coming forward is Mr. Tolley. He is going to, and he is also accompanied by our um, guest from Chesapeake <coughs> Community College. They'll introduce themselves, and they're going to talk with us about um, our Early College Academy. You'll be excited to hear about the opportunities that we'll offer students coming up next year. Good evening, and thank you very much for your time. Uh, my name is Dave Harper. I'm interim vice president uh, for uh, academics and workforce training at Chesapeake College. Good evening again, uh, members of the board. Thank you for allowing us to present tonight. Uh, my name is Adam Tolley, supervisor of CTE and social studies. And uh, like Mr. Harper said, we are very excited to, to be here tonight and present uh, information to you on this wonderful endeavor of early college and, and provide some information on that and to uh, just give you a basic overview of, of what early college is. So. Um, in our presentation tonight, quickly, we're just going to introduce the concept of what early college is. Uh, we are going to discuss what this is going to look like for um, Queen Anne's County Public Schools and in the high schools. Talk about our next steps with uh, Chesapeake College and maybe and give you an overview of um, you know our work to this point, and then talk about a timeline for implementation and and what that would look like. So just just a basic overview of what early early college is, um, it's, a, it's a model that allows students to both um, to attend high school and attain a, an associate's degree, uh, which I'm going to let Mr. Harper talk about um, shortly, or an AAS degree, and he's going to give you some information on that. These are some national statistics about early college. Um, in terms of graduation rates, um, just kind of outlining that students who are part of early college um, outperform uh, on average, you know, our, our students, per, you know, going through a general program in, in high school. A quick word on this as we introduce the concept. So our research from largely uh, the Community College Research Center um, and elsewhere, but it's national research shows that there are a couple things that we can do to help students persist through to an associate's degree. Uh, two things. The first is the earlier students start uh, with a clear path, the more likely they are to finish that path, right? And, and the second point is the, the better we define that path for the student, 
the more likely that student is to be successful. So very, very frequently at community colleges, you know, we think about multiplying programs in response to community needs. That is indeed a good thing. Our faculty creatively design new courses in, in response to their own research and, stu and, and student needs. That's a good thing. But the result sometimes is a dizzying array of options that can confuse first-generation college students attempting to navigate what amounts to a bureaucracy in pursuit uh, to an associate's degree. So one of the things that early college is exciting, one of the reasons that early college is exciting to us is it gives us an opportunity to reach students earlier so that they can get started, a head start on their college education. And it also allows them to uh, engage in college in a safe environment, in a well-defined curriculum where they have uh, lots of supports. Thanks. I'm going to skip ahead and then, I'll, then I'm going to come back to our sure. degree piece just to <clears throat> hopefully you, this is an example of an early uh, college academy model in Baltimore County and this this is taking place this school year. Um, so basically what happens is the first two years of high school students are going to take up to one course per semester um, taught by the faculty of the community college um, in Baltimore and the last two years they're going to take uh, at least one class in the morning at school and then travel um, by bus to the to the community college there to, to finish up um, and again this is this is their example we haven't gotten to the point yet to to define what our example was going to look like but I just wanted to kind of give you an overview of, of what that is so the students go go to school um, take the courses that they need and in the end that they are going to come out with uh, an associate's degree or an AAS which I'm going to let Mr. Harper kind of go into depth about a little bit. Sure. So uh, the, the degree most are familiar with when it comes to community colleges would be your traditional AA degree which prepares students for transfer to four-year school. So we think of community colleges as two-year schools, the first two in that four-year progression. Uh, though, of course, we offer also an array of AAS degrees, essentially terminal degrees that are designed to prepare students for the workforce. And this is one of the reasons that early college is often leveraged so that uh, a student who is selecting an AAS track in early college could graduate with a high school diploma and a credential to enter the workforce at the same time. So a question that arises around early college is will these credits, these college credits, transfer to a four-year school. And in an, the case of an AAS, that's less of an issue if the degree is preparation to enter the workforce. In the case of an associate's, if the student has earned the complete associate's, then uh, it, we have an, an articulated agreement with all colleges in the Maryland system that that associate's uh, transfers as a package, so the student enters as a junior. Is, and as far as, actually I'm going to skip ahead and then I'll come back to, to the workforce um, development piece. So what we, we, we are proposing um, for the 2018-2019 um, uh, school year is a liberal arts pathway. And I have a, a link here, I'm going to click on that so we can look to see what that actually looks like and, and Mr. Harper will be able to explain um, Sure. So, depth about that too. so one of the things, one of the things that the liberal arts pathway provides, is a projection of how the student would undertake a path to sixty credits by the end of high school. So that sounds like a lot. A high school diploma, an associate's degree. What exactly does that look like? And it looks like a dovetail, in essence, uh, where the student begins taking mostly high school classes uh, and perhaps three credits in your first semester of your freshman year, right? Maybe six credits in, your, in the second half of your freshman year. And then it graduates to the point where instead of mostly high school classes with the occasional college credit, you're taking college credits exclusively. Now this can be accomplished in a variety of ways which would include uh, courses uh, articulated, so students sitting in a high school class earning college, cre earning college credit, and we would compare learning outcomes for that. Um, it could also include uh, college faculty coming to, to your campus to teach. Yes, ma'am. Just a quick thing on that. Um, so our high schools, you know, they, since they have two separate semesters, that's where you would fill that in. How do you do that if a school has a 
year round, say six six um, six courses as opposed to four each semester. Um, do you do you, then they just teach a college uh, course <coughs> over the course of the entire? Year, no, our courses. Well, I, we would have to. We would have to negotiate a compromise in that in, in that instance. In every early college example, you have to sit down and do a one-to-one -one course by course comparison and figure out how the schedule scheduling is going to work. And we'll have to. And we're willing to do that by county, uh, and if necessary, by school within the county, uh, within each county. But our our semesters would maintain 15 week semesters. Do your semesters match. Our school mm -hmm. system right now. Well, in, in most cases, in, in the early college models, the, the high school students actually get more class time than they would if they were taking the, the class on campus. Um, so they actually have more time to more time to work, more time to study. Um, so that's like Mr. Harper said, that's something that we have to look at and, and figure, um, figure out how that's going to work and figure out the model that we're going to use in terms of when we're going to teach at the school, um, when we're going to go to the college, how this hybrid model is going to work. So, my second one is: Would this doing this pilot year next year? Would that that way you would only be able to start with freshmen, like someone who's already been a freshman now can't possibly do it because um, they're going to be a, a sophomore. So you basically want to start them at the beginning in this pilot to see if it works. Or I would have no. We would the co our college would have no problem with opening those doors to someone who's a sophomore, say. Now, it would be with the acknowledgement that it may not be possible for a person starting as a sophomore to finish the full program by graduation, but in that case, the person comes away with X credits more than he or she would have had. So no, that's okay with us. Can I ask how this, difference, dif how this is different than just our dual enrollment now? It's, it, it's dual enrollment expanded. So, so this results in a degree. Students can take dual enrollment courses right now that really are any course, but it may not end in a pathway that leads them to a degree. It, so that, that's a significant that's difference. The difference. Okay. And with regard to scheduling, you know, most of the time the schedules are about the same because they still are going on a semester, but sometimes I know this that I've done this in the past in another school, in other school districts, and maybe spring break is off and not the same time at the college as it is at the high school. Yeah. So we work that out and we determine what students will be responsible for doing and, and that kind of thing. So we can certainly manipulate the schedule uh, to work it out so that students can, you know, can participate. That won't be a barrier. Thank you, Dr. Kane. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, and to your point, we do have a, occasional students, maybe two a year, who complete an associates by the time they graduate high school, mm -hmm. just on their own initiative. And what early college does is the heavy lifting of all the extraordinary planning that they chose to do to make that possible. And one of the things, we have some te technical difficulties here, but anybody who clicks into Board Docs and has, the presentation is there, and you can click on the link that says Liberal Arts, and what that would show you is a series of courses by semester, uh, samples that students might take. So when they would take their um, history or their biology or, or whatever the case may be, when they would take their courses, just sort of laid out for them, it's a sample is what that would have been. So as we start this off, um, you know, we talk about just starting off with liberal arts pathway, um, just starting off with the progression that Mr. Harper talked about. But, but the great thing is, is that we have so many opportunities for this to expand. And, and um, as you know, the last time that I was here, I talked about CTE and, and all the wonderful opportunities. And, and early college uh, really lends itself to CTE and, and the options that are there, which takes us back to, to the workforce development. and. Um, we've spent a lot of time and, and I've spent some time with the Economic Development Commission here in Queen Anne's and looking at workforce needs and looking at the state, what, is, what, are, what are the trends, what are we needing in Queen Anne's County? And so Chesapeake College is very responsive to this as well. So this lends itself to developing programs for our students that actually meet workforce needs in our area. Um, and we have options and, and like Dr. King said, we're having a couple difficulties here, but there is also a CTE um, pathway that we can look at that deals with construction trades. And when they come out of this, they come out with the AAS degree, which is 
a terminal degree that sets them up, um, you know, right for right for the workforce. And here here's here's the construction trades here, and this this gives an example. And the liberal arts um, looks very similar to this too. So it just shows on the left hand side the courses that that they need, and so the fall um, of their freshman year then they're just taking one course. So they're kind of easing their way into it. And you can see it just gradually progresses um, until they get the credits that they need for, for their degree. And the beauty of the CTE uh, course, coursework is that we're aligning our curriculum with apprenticeship standards for ABC so that when that is desired, it is possible. And with NCCR, a curriculum so that uh, national recognized certifications are possible for people who want to have something in the back pocket to get a job with, at, you know, after high school. And this an, this an acknowledgement of Chesapeake College's uh, reorganization, which you may be familiar with, integrating our credit and non-credit um, arms as a way of elevating our non-credit and workforce training elements to the same level as, as we have focused on our associate's degree and transfer pathways because we acknowledge that our local students need an opportunity to get good jobs and stay local if they want to and and we want to be the credentialing institution for them and we want to be responsive to the businesses in the community and the parents and the families in the community who tell us we, we who tell us that they're looking for training for viable gainful uh, livelihood here <coughs> would these um, classes be uh, weighted as in the AP classes? Yeah, and so we've had some conversation about needing to re, uh, revise our grading um, policy, but dual enrollment courses are, are weighted courses, will be weighted courses. Okay, great, mm -hmm. finally. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the other thing I just wanted to add to that, that the board uh, may recall a little over a year ago that there was a presentation on PTECH, Pathways to, to Technology. And so this is very similar to PTECH in the fact that PTECH didn't, there's a lot of requirements to that, staffing positions. So there's not all those, the, the strict requirements of that, but this allows us to basically do the same thing for more kids. And, and piggybacking on the more kids, so we continue to talk about diversity and we continue to talk about access as a, as a measure of equity. We have gotten um, commitment from Senator, I'm sorry, from Commissioner Jack Wilson to help support us in our efforts in transporting students. So right now, if a student does not have access to transportation to get him to the community college, then he can't go. But what we'll be able to do is we'll be able to offer this opportunity to students whether they have transportation or not yes. because we have commitments from partners and as well as Chesapeake Community College Mr. Harper has done a yeoman's job he has been planning with us for months and months on end um, and we have commitments from workforce development lots of folks in the community want to see our students working in the community they want to see our students having opportunities to participate in dual enrollment early college Academy types of programs and so it really is a community effort and we're grateful to have you as <coughs> partners so thank you grateful to be here I, I think it sounds good. On the PTEC, on the PTEC um, wasn't there, wasn't that one of Governor Hogan's initiatives that had a grant going with it, too? Um, even though this isn't exactly what they said with those requirements, would there be a way to present this to maybe get a piece of that, that grant? Have you guys tried that? Th that grant came with a lot of strings, yeah. okay. expensive strings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I don't. The, yeah, I, I think when, 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 when I, I believe when we initially looked at it, that would be uh, upwards of almost half a million dollars a year mm -hmm. once we started it to go on from that point forward. There were transportation costs, there were staffing costs, you had to have an administrator, you had to have a liaison, there were um, costs on the community college side of staffing positions that they had to have. So to Dr. Harper's point, there, there were a lot of strings and, and pieces to that, that that we just felt we couldn't do that at that time. And so we started to talk about, so what's our other options? And then okay. early college. 
Thank you very much. Definitely. And so far as, as far as next steps go, like Dr. Kane said, we, we've done a lot of planning to this point. Uh, we still have a lot of planning left. Um, so we are continuing to look at our, our schedules and we want to, to make sure that this, like Captain Kelly mentioned, we want to make sure our schedules are going to line up with the college schedules and, and look at staffing and look at the models. So we do have a lot of planning left, but, but we are very committed um, to this and we want to be able to roll this out to parents and, and let them know, you know, this is a, it's a wonderful opportunity. There is a commitment that is involved in this, um, but it, the, the benefits and the opportunity that exists for kids is, is just great. I mean, the, the idea of coming out of high school with 60 transferable credits um, at a fraction of the cost that, that, it would, that it would cost you to start in initially at a four-year institution, is just, it's overwhelming. It really is, and everybody knows the, um, the expenses associated with college, and, and it, 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 it grows every year. So it's just a wonderful opportunity. So um, we are certainly very thankful for Mr. Harper and his commitment, and, and we uh, look forward to continue to, to develop this, and, and we will certainly keep you up to date on, on our progress. Do we have next year targeted as a pilot year? Yes. Excellent. Yes. So, like Grace mentioned, that they're having an orientation for incoming ninth graders. Mm -hmm. Will this be a part of that orientation for them to be notified as parents and family members of the opportunity that is there when they become a ninth grader next year? We aren't going to make that timeline because we've got to clear up some other things. Gotcha. But we, when we do get it, we mm -hmm. will have orientation for families so Aside that they can, an okay. in, in information night, let me Excellent. put it that way, so that Excellent. they can understand yep. what the program is. Uh, <laughs> we're doing double time in our planning right now because we really want to have something on the table for scheduling gotcha. for next year. So we right. found uh, you know a common course mm -hmm. that regardless of the degree mm -hmm. that you want to seek that that course will fit within that just to get ninth graders started Excellent. so um, we'll, we'll be preparing for that and we are prepared to provide orientation whether it be as you determine late summer early fall so that we have a bit extra scaffolding for for new students gotcha young right. new students. I, is this going to be offered to everyone? Don't, I notice you have an emphasis on low income and minority, but it is going to be open to everyone and do we oh, have, absolutely. are we thinking through a selection process or? That, that, yes we are thinking through a selection process and all the details of that aren't yet hammered out. I guess my question was on um, the financial commitment as a parent, um, it sounds attractive to have a child uh, finish high school with an associates, but I question what the price tag would be on, on me. And then I also question um, how families that don't have the means um, would be able to take advantage of this situation. Well, we, there are a few things that can mitigate that. Those are excellent questions and ones we share. For one, dual enrollment grants exist up to 12 credits, so there's some moderation there. For another, the articulation agreement that we, we can work out, whereby some of the college credits come from in the high school classes, will moderate the cost. Um, so that could be as many, that, that could get us close to 30, say, of those 60 credits. So you're looking at excellent savings there. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, we'd have to rely on grants. And we've taken an important step forward with the decision to select liberal arts because that helps us see what kinds of grants to go after. Let's say we were to choose later uh, CTE in the construction trades. Now we know we have to go after some local businesses, right? To say, these are the people we're credentialing. Can you help us out in this endeavor? So can we, can we make it free? We can't at this juncture, but let's see what we can do. And it, it will be at a significant savings. Do we, do we know if our traditional FAFSA application is something that could be utilized at that at age. This age no, not level. at that age. Not at that age level. That's my concern. Right. That's right. So they're either going to be and getting. That's my concern too is that we're going to have a lot of children mm -hmm. that that are going to be left out. Yep. I hear a lot of children say even now, in eighth grade, you know, you ask if they're going to college. You know, what what are you going to do when you go to high school? What are you going to go? Um, I'm not going to college. We can't afford to go to college. Right. You know, I, and I don't think that we put enough emphasis on these children to know that, that it is out there. We assume that children know that there is scholarships out there. Uh, children don't know that. A lot of parents don't know that. Um, 
This parent's working through that right now. Right. I'm confused. Mm -hmm. Full-time job, too. Yeah. There's 5,000 different scholarships. You know, what do you apply for? So I think we have to do a better job um, educating our children first because the children are the ones that always take it home to the <coughs> parent. You get the child interested, you get the parent interested. And that is, I, I'm, that's my biggest fear is that a lot of children will not be able I, I agree. And in the situation now, when children graduate high school, you know, families that have the means, the kids then go away to a campus. We're going to now be looking at a situation where these children are all walking the hallways and it's, uh, you know, much more apparent who is now having some means who and, and who, who may not. not. Right. Yep. So that's, yep. those are social kinds of questions that I think need to be um, looked at in, as we move forward with this. Yep. I agree. I agree. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you all Thank very you. much. Privilege to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much. So next we're going to ask Mr. Brown to come forward. He's going to share with us um, a presentation regarding teacher and principal evaluation data. Good evening. Uh, tonight we'll be taking a look at the teacher and principal evaluations. Uh, we're going to look at the, the factors that, that make the comprehensive evaluation and we're going to take a look at uh, some of the 2016-17 data. Uh, comprehensive <coughs> evaluations uh, for both teachers and principals uh, occur each year. Uh, the comprehensive evaluation is based equally on the professional practice portion as well as on student growth. Uh, based on calculations, teachers and principals are identified as either ineffective, effective, or highly effective. Can I ask a couple questions on this? Sure. Um, can you explain how the 50-50 is determined? Uh, half of it is based on the, the prof professional practice piece, which is determined for teachers, for instance, the, the principal does a professional practice evaluation uh, and it is converted into a numeric value based on the, the four areas that we'll be talking about later. Uh, and then there is an SLO process as well that we'll be talking about. And that SLO process comes through with a numerical value, each one worth 50%. Uh, the two values are put together and based on a scale that was determined a few years ago, it ranks the teacher, rates the teacher in one of those three areas. Okay, and, and you say based on calculations the teachers and principals are one of those three categories, like how are those calculations determined? Is there criteria for those? For the three categories, it's strictly numeric. Uh, if, if the total is at a certain point, a cutoff, they become effective, and if they meet the next number on the scale, they are highly effective. And is there's, what calculation determines what, how you come up with that? I, I think that may be covered I, or it, let, later Yeah, let me work my way through the presentation if I can okay, answer one last question. Though, is it updated annually, or is, it, is this something that we do one formula for forever? Uh, the formula has remained the same for the past uh, three, three, four years now. Four years. That. Yes. Uh, teachers, professional practice piece, uh, teachers that are due for a new certification or renewal, renewed certification receive a new professional practice evaluation that year. If they are not up for recertification uh, and they were already considered an effective or highly effective teacher, then they go two years without another professional practice evaluation. Their score is carried over for two additional years. Unless they 
uh, requests from the principal to be re-evaluated on their professional practice portion. Uh, teachers can also receive a rating of developing in their professional practice piece if they are a non-tenured teacher or in some cases tenured teachers if, if there are some extenuating circumstances. However, that rating itself is a Queen Anne's County rating. We cannot submit developing to MSDE. Uh, when we do the calculations and submit to MSDE, developing must be converted to ineffective. Uh, <clears throat> there are four professional practice domains that we use. They're all based on the Danielson framework. Uh, uh, their teachers are rated on their planning and preparation, instruction and assessment, classroom environment, and their professional responsibilities. <clears throat> the professional practice piece for principals. Uh, principals do receive a professional practice evaluation each year. Uh, the rating of developing may also be used for principals, for a principal that is new to the role. But again, this is unique to Queen Anne's County and it cannot be reported to state, the state as developing. So when we do the report to the state, any principals that are developing are considered ineffective. Uh, the professional practice categories are clusters from the leadership framework and those clusters are professional learning, instruction and assessment, school environment and vision and they're not all equally weighed. They are 15% for everything but vision and 5% of the comprehensive evaluation uh, for vision. One important piece on the principal's professional practice is that we will be receiving new standards uh, in the next school year, 2018-19. Who, who evaluates them? Uh, they are evaluated by the superintendent and the assistant superintendent. <clears throat> Besides professional practice, the other portion of the uh, evaluation, the comprehensive evaluation is student growth. Uh, Queen Anne's County, we use SLOs or student learning objectives to measure student growth. Each teacher develops two student learning objectives working collaboratively with the building principal. Uh, teachers are encouraged whenever possible to base their SLOs on two different approved me uh, measures. And high school teachers uh, that teach HSA content courses are required to have at least one SLO linked to their uh, high school assessment uh, student class performance. So that would be your four content areas that are taking the high school assessments, uh, government, algebra one, English 10, and now it will be science in general. Uh, it used to just be biology. Principals develop three student learning objectives, working collaboratively with the superintendent and the assistant superintendent. And principals are encouraged to uh, predicate at least two of their SLOs on improving student group performance, uh, which in turn will improve the results on our state and district assessments. Uh, before I actually talk about 16, 17 data, Ms. George, have I answered your questions or do you still, still have uh, some more? One question is when do the pic when did, so the teachers pick their SLOs, correct? What they're going to um, measure on? Yes. What, do they do that at the beginning of the year? Usually by early October, they're, they're supposed to have their SLOs selected. And then they have the remainder of the year to work on their SLOs. So they've had what, about a month and about a month with the kids? Correct. I can I we go back because um, I, I I have a question here um, where it says um, the uh, developing um, it, t when it's set to the state. Yes. Um, why is it done like that? Why is it different? Why are we doing one thing and sending something else to the state? When the task force developed our procedures in Queen Anne's County, we thought it was much better if you had a new teacher that was struggling but making progress, but didn't quite reach the effective range to be able to designate them as developing rather than just saying you're ineffective. 
so there is a, a range there that is developing. That's, so there's ineffective developing and then effective and highly effective. Well, I guess my question but is, is this, what is the range where we have a teacher that is struggling and really it, basically the state would be saying that that teacher is ineffective, correct? Correct. Um, what range do we use um, to say that? Because Without giving you actual numbers, mm -hmm. uh, it, it would be a very small slice of the, the upper ineffective. It's just before you, you reach effective. I'm confused. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, me too. Because I'm, I'm wondering if we're sending, if, if we're, if we have a teacher that is ineffective, but we're sending a report to MSDE saying that this teacher is developing, is, no, is that what you're no, saying? No, it's the other way around. Um, for instance, if, if the scale, and, and I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but if the, the, the bottom point of being effective was 25 points, and we have a brand new teacher to the county, and they are only scoring 23 or 24 points, we would be calling them developing. They're at the very high end of ineffective. They're not quite over that threshold to call them effective. Rather than in-house calling them ineffective, we refer to them as developing. And but when we do report was, to MSDE, range, since they haven't met that, that threshold, they are still ineffective it, by, by MSDE. Is that threshold. just that top level, 23, 24? Just that 24. very top level. 20, they're going up as ineffective. <coughs> right. I think that was, that was my understanding of where, and that was coming from. Where do we create that range? Right. It's and who created, the, who created it's, that it's range? It's like standards-based education for evaluating teachers. <laughs> they're developing. They're, not, they're still failing, but they're developing. But you said it's it goes to the state, it reads ineffective. Yeah. When it goes it's to the not, state, it reads ineffective. It, it well, does, they are considered ineffective. Like to the state. Mm -hmm. To the state. Oh, yeah. but the but how while we're spending a lot of time talking about developing, we had absolutely no developing teachers last year or the well, previous I'm year. Well, I'm very glad to hear that, but, but I guess still my question is really not being answered because I'm, you know, where do we even draw the line at a teacher that is at 23 or 24? How long do we let that teacher be at a 23 oh, or a 24? They can only be developing one year. Right. They can only be a yes. developing teacher one year. And what's the difference between like being an effective teacher and a highly effective teacher? I mean, is it if someone's effective, what would what would determine them being highly effective? And what would be the purpose of being labeled highly effective? What are the benefits? What are what would be the negatives of only being a, a effective? There is no change in pay. There is right. no change in status. So it what, is, so we, we are required to report to MSDE the number of teachers that we categorize as ineffective, effective, and highly effective. And it's a reporting piece. Uh, is it subjective? Is it subjective according to who's doing that evaluating? Or the, is there the, the a professional standard? practice piece is a little more subjective because it is one or two people that is going in and observing the teacher with their classrooms, taking notes and writing a year-end evaluation on those four categories that we talked about. So that can be relatively subjective. And applying numbers to those categories. And it applies that based on, on where those are scored at. Uh, the student growth piece is a little more objective because you're actually looking at data. Did the students get moved from point A to point B over the course of the year? Gotcha. Or how many students got moved from point A to and point B? And that's what makes the teacher ineffective, effective, highly effective. Well, the, both piece. make that. Well, one the, piece, The subjective yeah. and the objective portion of it, the, the professional practice and the comprehensive piece together is what we turn into the state. The state does not see our professional practice results. I am sharing them with you because one of the points is what is the effect of the student growth on the professional practice? And, and there have been teachers that were, have had concerns that the uh, student growth piece may hurt them more than it helps them. Well, it certainly does depend on their student performance. It does. 
Well, I guess that's my concern is that, you know, yeah. that's why I want to know how long we, we allow to have an ineffective teacher because that ineffective teacher at some point is um, um, that, that's going to the students as well. So however, we have children leaving a class that may not. However, do we have that ineffective rating because that teacher has an overloaded number of high risk exactly. or at risk yeah. children? Oh, absolutely. That, that all brings has her to, numbers or his numbers down. And demographics. I mean, demographics right. plays right. a huge mm -hmm. role in the effects of your SLOs <laughs> and if you're going to be highly effective so you, and not. You might be um, in that developmental stage today. And next year, you have a very high functioning class and you're up to high efficiency. Right. There's not a really good gauge to justify that, that difference. Well, that, that's, that's all student performance. That, that's something I don't understand actually being new here is, you know, how are students assigned to teachers? Is it somewhat like shared in terms of high functioning versus not high functioning? I really have never put my finger on that. Does any, can it, is that even relevant to her? It is a relevant our, question, but I don't have the answer. Yeah. I don't have that. So I haven't been here long enough to know <laughs> how they how they place students. Um, I can tell you that the um, you know a best practice in this day and age is to place students that are on multiple levels. So don't put all the highest kids in one class and don't put all the lowest kids in one class. So we look at heterogeneous grouping, meaning from they're from multiple levels, um, and so the teacher is expected to teach, teach children from multiple levels, which is common across the United States. Um, now, what I can tell you is that it is 50% based on student performance, but what I also know is that teachers are in charge of deciding how they are going to write that SLO and the assessments that they're going to use to measure that SLO. So it is not so... Um, uh, they're not so boxed in as it right. may seem, you know, at a glance. Right. So I, they do have some flexibility. Can I interject in there. with a question there, though? Sure. If they've, if a teacher's only been with a student for six, barely six weeks at that time that they're submitting their SLO, are they provided data from the year before to show yes. what yep. the progress of yes. how they're going to base that? Because yep. that's not a yeah, lot of time to be with a student. Yeah, yeah. So they do get. And Mr. P can answer. Um, but they do get data from the year before and then they get the pre-test data from the beginning of the school year, and they're expected to show some growth. So if a student is functioning, I'm gonna make some numbers up, if a student is functioning at a 40%, maybe that's their pre-test score, um, and, and students are expected to meet a goal of say 70%, by mid-year some point, you wanna see that student has made, I don't know, 20 points gain or something like that, some growth. Even if a student doesn't make the full goal, if they don't meet the full goal, the expectation is that student performance yeah. will have progressed from the beginning of the year right. to the end of the year, even if they don't make the exact goal. But one thing that I can say, I'm not quite sure how it goes with um, teachers just yet, but with principals, there is a level of flexibility in there that you should be aware of. Um, so say, for example, if a, if a principal has an SLO where they think a student, a student group maybe should meet 75%, right? They're not just looking at 75%. They've got the flexibility in this district to say, well, 65 to 75%, and then I still will have met my goal. So there's a lot of flexibility in there. Um, so it's not boxed in. Which, it, it, in my opinion, it should be, for the reason being, you have teachers, and you, their schools are not made up of all one kind of child. Sure. Absolutely not. Every school has, every class has different kinds. Mm -hmm. And I think that we have to be fair to our teachers and to our principals that, you know, um, as long as you do see growth, and I guess that's what I'm trying to get across, is that as long as you see growth, I wouldn't want to see a teacher be called ineffective because she, he um, has a child, like you said, at 40, but only gets to 55. It depend, and it depends you know, on that student. If right. that student's potential is to 55 and right. that child made it, that's a lot of growth for some students. Right. But right. if that child's potential is 80 and they made 65, right. they've right. not met that. Right. There you go. So it, it really there does go. depend on the student. Right. And I right. apologize, I keep saying Mr. P is no, gonna no, no. respond. And, and, and I think <laughs> the, the other thing that we've gotta take into consideration, and I think Ms. George, to your point is, that's why we got to allow time, teachers' time. When I have a class, 
and I'm looking at their trend data when I get them, but I need a good month, month and a half to determine, you know, how little Sid is doing with me in my class <laughs> to determine, you know, based upon this trend data, but I'm getting some different information. So I get to know him and it's over a month right. so I can determine within my class, where are my biggest gaps? And that's really what this is all about. This is all about one big alignment puzzle. When we talk about school improvement planning and where the gaps are overall, and then when we dig into this with principals, we're looking at the gaps overall in their school and what they need to target, and then they in turn are having those same conversations with their teachers, or should be, about the, the achievement of and the gaps that are taking place and what is the strategies that they're going to need, what is the professional development that they need, how are they going to monitor that. And that's why this, you know, when we talk about the superintendent monitoring visits that we're, we just finished one, we're getting ready to do, that's for us in central office to monitor how well that this is actually taking place at the school. In fact, next month in the February meeting, we're having the same conversation with principals. What is the summary of, the, of what you're finding mid-year with the SLOs of your teachers? What adjustments do you need to make? What adjustments do they need to make? What new information are they learning? How do we continue to target? It still goes back to this equity piece of looking at what students are learning, what they're not learning, and how we need to learn as quickly as we can to target to help them. And who's learning right. and, and who's not learning. And who's learning and who's not learning. And what are we doing about it? And, and I hope you can start to see how all these pieces that we're working on, how they all start playing together to improve the performance of all students. One last question, though. Is there, is there different criteria? Okay, so if you're a <coughs> principal or a teacher in an elementary school, your class is going to consist of 24 students. Maybe in your, your class, your, as a principal, you're going to have more teacher or less teachers in elementary school versus... A middle school where a teacher would have 130 to 160 kids right. and that principal may have more teachers versus high school where again it keeps growing mm -hmm. so is there different criteria for them selecting their SLOs or or based on I mean is it just a subgroup so say since my husband teaches middle school I would pick like does he just pick one of his classes to, to focus the SLO on or is it all of based on all of his students and is it fair for a middle school teacher who has 150 kids versus an elementary school teacher who has 24 yes it's fair mr. P <laughs> uh, part of that is is one is is take you know if you got multiple courses as a as a high school teacher um, you're gonna narrow that focus down more often if it's in a if it's in a tested area obviously or if it's in if it's not um, teach it and Dr. Kane had mentioned this there's a lot of flexibility with the approval of the SLO goes through a formal process of that teacher bringing that data to to the principal to be able to show the evidence what is the evidence in this group of students that I have of where there's a, a deficit yeah. and then what am I going to do over this interval of time what strategies am I going to target how am I going to monitor that so I'm starting to begin to see progress so what I guess what I'm confused on is so is, uh, do they group them like so in elementary school in middle you're not looking at every single student you're going to say sure. okay I want my high flyers to progress at this level I want my student groups yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's about groups. So middle it's schools. Not one child. No, no. No. So middle schools, middle school teachers will likely have larger groups because it can go across classes, but it probably will be in a content area, mm -hmm. the same content area. Um, elementary teachers teach multiple contents, but one group. So exactly the flip. But they still can get a group of students. So depending upon what I did as a principal, is had to look at, um, well, I wasn't a principal at that point, but what we were doing is, we had a look at the data to see where the student deficits are. And that's the area that you want to focus on. So what we've done, and some of our principals have done a yeoman's job of selecting the student groups that are struggling the most, yes. because they are the ones that need to make the most group uh, progress to be proficient. So they've taken that challenge on. It's been great. 
they might make it, they might not. But what we have said to them is that we are not going to beat you over the head for trying. We want <laughs> you to try. We want you to take some risk. And we want you to look at exactly what we need to be doing with groups of students who are struggling, especially if these groups of students have struggled historically. And there has not been a focus on this group of students right. to see what type of strategies we ought to be using with these students, whether the strategy is all academic or some academic and some social. Mm -hmm. So because all of that plays a part into it. So we, we, uh, you're asking the right questions and you're asking great questions because it is not a cut and dry answer. It depends on the students. It depends and there's flexibility for the teacher, both the teacher and the principal to decide which groups of students that they want to work with, which assessments they're going to be using with the help of supervisors and how we'll measure their progress and checkpoints throughout the way. And so we've been involved as central office team and not only Mr. P and I, but Ms. Pauls and the supervisors and C and I, it has been, and special, it has been a, a really good, thorough, thought out process for how we've been working with the, um, with the schools. So I, I think that we, we may see some teachers maybe not meeting SLOs that may have met SLOs before because they're taking the risk because they're taking the risk to show to set uh, SLOs for student groups that struggle and need a focus. And we're not going to beat them up because that student group didn't meet 70 or 75 percent. If that group went from 40 to 60 and that was the capacity of that group, we applaud that and we look at the strategies that we use and we share those strategies across schools. I apologize my back. No, you're fine. We share those strategies across schools to see what we can learn from one another. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it is about taking each student to their highest potential. It's part of our theory of action. Every month we meet, we look at that theory of action, and we talk about if we have the will, if we are committed, if we plan together, if we build our capacity collectively, then we'll be well positioned right. to move these student groups so that all students can perform to their highest potential. And improve. Yes because I think we're going to hear how do you ensure that by increasing the support to the lower level functioning group you do not lose function from the top group because it's a standard you're doing it's going to go across the board and the whole class is going to be coming up it stands to reason that if that SOL has been guided through by the teacher and the students you know performance and, and they know what they're looking for they have written part of that SOL for that high performance group to improve as well. Yeah. So it's going to all go up, hopefully. So, in a so, so world. what we what we want to see, and this is just I'm sorry for the the visual here, but what we want to see, yeah, we want to see this, but we want to see this. We want to see this group also rising and closing or at least eliminating, narrowing right. that gap. Right. So everybody goes up, but we yeah. got to do some things with this group a yes. bit differently. Yes. So because they've got some, right, we've got to accelerate right. that progress. Right. These guys, they may be high, but there's probably some students in that group that can go, go even higher. higher. Oh, yeah. right. So yeah. it's yeah. work that has to be done with both groups right. of students. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. right. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. This data, though, I think the data, though, is used, more effectively used just to do what you said. It's not really grading the teacher, is it? Grading it, the it, principal? It, it, it is because, and it's not a Queen Anne's County thing. It is the states, you know, across the United States have been committed to this teacher principal evaluation. And part of it is that states got to say whether what part you want to use for professional practice evaluation and what part you want to use for a uh, student performance. And so, you know, we married that in the state of Maryland, and that's how we came up with the two together. So it is about student performance, but it is about what teachers do and what principals do to increase the level of student performance. So it works hand in hand. Yeah, that's where that ineffective, effective, mm -hmm. and highly effective mm -hmm. comes in. That's what made yeah. me, yeah. you know, question that was because that's, I want to make sure um, that all teachers are effective because if they're not, then our students are not learning. And they're not, the gap is never going to change if we don't do that. If we're not making sure that those teachers, we hold those teachers to that standard 
to make sure that's why I'm, you know, 23, 24, I'm okay, but how long do we allow that 23, 24 to go? Right, and, and what you just said is absolutely right because you also look at it the other way because, you know, we see, and that's an interesting data point that we have no teachers listed here that are developing. However, we have student groups that are not performing and have not performed in a long, long time. Right. So who gets right. held responsible for right. that? Right, that's right. right. Exactly. So we've got to look at it both ways. Are we just calling our teachers and our principals Principles highly effective and effective, even though students are not meeting performance exactly. benchmarks. Exactly. Right? Exactly. We, yeah. We've got to look at that as That's well. Right. And how can we build their capacity so that they are equipped to work with students who are exactly. historically not performing? That's exactly. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. The other, just one more comment about the SLO it is not an all or nothing proposition. Uh, there is basically the ratings for that is no attainment if, if the teacher had made absolutely no growth towards the SLO. There's partially attained if they made some growth, and there's fully attained if, if they met their goal. So again, it's not an all or nothing uh, rating. Uh, the data that you're looking at is both the professional practice portion and the comprehensive evaluation for our teachers from last year. If we just look at the professional practice piece, the subjective piece, uh, less than four-tenths of our staff, our, our teachers, were ineffective. 75% were effective, and almost 25% of our teachers were highly effective. That's just using the professional practice piece. When we put in the student learning objectives, uh, it does make a change. Uh, it did not change our numbers on ineffective teacher. Still less than 0.4% of our teachers. Effective teachers were now less than 50% of our teachers are effective and almost 50% <coughs> of our teachers are now highly effective based you know, when you include the SLO in, into it. And, and breaking that down and, and looking at the effect of the SLO on individual teachers, uh, we had 19 teachers that the SLO had a negative effect on. We had two teachers that started out as effective based on their professional practice piece that ended up being ineffective when we added the SLO into it. And 17 that were highly effective that ended up bouncing down to effective. We had 343 teachers that had no effect based on their SLO. If they were effective, on the professional practice piece, they were effective in the, the comprehensive evaluation. Uh, and a positive effect on the SLO, we actually had two ineffective teachers that when the SLO was put in became effective teachers. And we had 147 that were effective, but after the SLO points were added, became highly effective. So the SLO, uh, had a more positive impact on teachers than a negative impact. It, it, it actually only hurt 19 of our 511 teachers. For principal data, <clears throat> again the same information, presented the same way. 10% of our principals were ineffective. Uh, on professional practice, 20% were effective, 70% were highly effective, strictly on the professional practice piece. With the SLOs put in, 10% uh, were ineffective, 70% were effective, and 20% were highly effective. So it actually had a negative impact on five principles uh, and had absolutely no impact on the other five principles that were rated. I have a question about that. Yes, we have 14 principals. How do we come up with 10? We only had 10 <laughs> principals that were evaluated last year. We had why uh, only 10? We had a couple of principals that that left before or, or right after the end of the year and did not receive <coughs> a final evaluation. We also had some principals shift from one building to the other, uh, to another during the school year, and it just would not be. You know, fair to give them an SLO based on a building they weren't in for the whole year. So we did not do an, a comprehensive evaluation on them. So the 10 that we're looking at were in their position the entire year at their Correct. school. Okay. 
Uh, again, the conclusions, I've already mentioned most of this. We had 511 comprehensive teacher evaluations, uh, less than 0.4 were ineffective. 49% uh, were effective, 49% were highly effective. Uh, we had negative impact on 19 teachers. The rest of the teachers, it, uh, 140, yeah. had a positive in effect on 149 teachers, moving, uh, increasing two from ineffective to the professional practice piece uh, to effective on the comprehensive evaluation. It moved 147 uh, from effective to highly effective. Those 19 teachers, are they, um, are they doing better now? Or is, is only one evaluation done? The, the teacher evaluations that we submit to MSDE are anonymous. They, they, we do not link teacher information to that. So I couldn't tell you who they are. Uh, principals would have that information, and they could go in and look at it. So until we have the next year's numbers, we won't know do we have more than 19 or less than 19. Right. Okay. That's a lot of teachers. Well, it's um, not really of. I, I understand, but that's still, uh, as far as I'm concerned, it's one, one too many. Well, it's 19 too many. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, but it's still only what percentage? I, I, I understand 19 that. teachers is the ones that had that. negative <laughs> impact. They still ended up being effective, effective or highly effective. Right. I'm sorry, effective. Uh, uh, actually, two of them were ineffective. So 17 of them still ended so, up being right. effective. So as of last year, we had two ineffective teachers. I'm not even sure those teachers still work for us anymore. And... They wouldn't have been put up as developing, or we don't know the answer to that. They could have been. They, would, the they were not developing. I know okay. that they were not. Because you said we had none for we the had last none two years. No okay. That's a key, year. and that's a good piece of information to know. Okay, that we didn't have anybody that was questionable, borderline. This is pretty cut and dried. It is. But it changes significantly when you put the two pieces together. Hmm. We completely flip flop. Our, pre our principal numbers. The principal numbers our change teacher numbers drastically. Are yes. Completely even when you do this. Yes, the principal numbers change drastically. Uh, well, they totally flip flop from 70 and 20 to 20 and 70. Yes. That's a complete turnaround. Is that because they are writing their SLOs correctly, or is that because they're achieving what they're putting in their SLOs, or is it a little bit of both? I would have to yield to this assistant superintendent. superintendent. Well, my gut I'm feeling sure is my gut feeling <laughs> is they are challenging themselves. You asked a what great we're doing question. Now I can't speak for this data, but I can tell you in 17, 18 <laughs> school year we have principals who are challenging themselves. Um, but Mr. P could speak to this data. That's why he's hiding over there. <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking last year was a blur. Uh, but you're, you're asking the exact right question. And when we always talk, and here's a really pivotal point to your comment. When we always talk about the word alignment, what in the heck, the, your question is right about alignment. That's the question that we're at. So when you, look at, when you look at the performance data, when you look at the teacher effectiveness data, when you look at the principal, something's telling us something's not aligned here. Yeah. So that's part of the monitoring work that we're doing. And what we're learning is that we need to make some adjustments to how principals are writing their SLOs. Uh, we also need to look at uh, the coaching we're providing them. In some cases, the teacher SLOs might not be rigorous enough. Right. I was uh, going to say, there's right. a big difference in number of teachers and number of principals, too. You got so it. So there you've got some disconnect. Right. So, so these are just some pieces among a lot of other pieces that we're looking at that these pieces aren't lining up. Right. And so that's the work that we're doing in, in targeting the work with principals. We already know we got to make some adjustments moving forward. And the other piece to this, which is the SLOs and the whole evaluation has been on hold because of ESSA. And as we learn more, 
this probably may or may not change, but right now it's it's on hold. We know the new standards uh, are going to come in place. In fact, at a future board meeting, Ms. Pauls and I are going to share with you what those new standards are on the professional practices side. Uh, and, and I think you'll see one of the things that Dr. Kane keeps talking about is the equity piece. There is a standard in there is about equity. Uh, so in school improvement, right. So all these pieces are starting to line up. Um, Do our teachers know their rating when yes. all is said and done? Absolutely. Even though it's anonymous to us, they know where they performed. They need to know so that. So their challenge, in my opinion, I'm not a teacher, but I'm very um, in tune with teachers, would be to become highly effective. It's a, it's a feather in your cap for your professional development to become highly effective. Sure, and, and, and I think... And if that's all there is to incite them to do so is their own knowledge that they have done that and improved to that point, and, I and hope to see that improve. But you know, I've been a teacher and I've taught at and been a principal at the lowest scoring school mm -hmm. in a large district. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't care if I ever was highly effective as long as, as I was making progressive oh, growth, right. continuous yes. okay. growth. So my right students yeah, continue right. to yep. progress. Improve. They didn't always progress at the same rate that mm -hmm. uh, the other schools in the district did, mm -hmm. but different. that's right. Exactly. But as long as they were progressing, Happy that's camper. That's what you want. And yeah. the title doesn't make any difference because nobody knows nobody about knows. it. Nobody right. knows. Well, right. that's right. And they don't so give you more money for it. So, right. I mean, it doesn't make any <laughs> difference. But this is the key. This is the Thank key. God. That your teachers want to see their students yeah. improving and Absolutely. progressing. Right. Absolutely. So, yeah. I agree with that 100%. And that is coming from the SLO being written correctly and being in enforced and effective yep. and what the right. end result of that is. Absolutely. And I would think... The better we get at that, the better our numbers are going to look. Absolutely. But again, in sure. the end, I mean, as a parent, I don't really care about numbers. You I, care about performance, I, I, though. I, they're yeah. children. They're not cars. They're not widgets. They're they're children, and everybody's different. And right. And I don't care if you know my teachers for the last ten years have gotten effective, highly effective. And you wouldn't you know, know unless they told right. you. Exactly. Right. right. You right. wouldn't know. All I know is right. I have a standard for my child, and I want to see my child yeah. to succeed at a certain standard. I mean, all this is just, I'm sorry, but state bureaucracy to prove, you know, it's yeah. just numbers. It, it's it, anything, Every kind yeah. of number and data can be skewed, and it, it's really kind of, and it's human nature to be able to play with your SLO, too. I mean, if, if I was a principal, you, there's a game in everything that you could play. Even a teacher, you could say, well, I know where I'm going to make it the easiest to to earn my SLO. So really, what is the effect of that? You're and so that, that the, the easiest pathway to get your highly right. effective. And so that's part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. So we've been having these conversations this year with principals. And it's not about picking an SLO that I know I can master or that I mm -hmm. mastered in right. December when mm -hmm. I still have six more months of the school year mm -hmm. to account for student performance. Mm -hmm. So th that is exactly a part of the conversation. And, you know, I understand the issue with numbers because the number doesn't make or break. But we've got to see students progressing that is the world that we live in yes. yeah. um, and right. we and we've got to you know I think we all agree to that yeah yes. work exactly. in it and we, yeah. we have to see we have to um, that gap has got to be um, and we're not the only county we're not the Absolutely only state not. you know yeah. it's yeah it's Everybody. all of us we're all struggling um, with um, with our children and their educations and um, and that to me is the biggest point is that we're we're getting that gap to start closing yeah. in yeah. to the the lower students, you know, that, that they, um, as I said to Mr. Tolley, you know, that they think that college is attainable to Absolutely. them. Because if you don't move, move them up at some point, what am I going to college for? Why would I go to college? I'm not smart enough to go to college, you know? And, and so we, we have to make that attainable to these kids that they know that you know we're there to to watch that gap close up mm -hmm. we've said this since since greg last year that's what we want to see we want to see that gap close mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's going to take time yes 
Yes. You know, it, it's not a miracle. Nobody, yeah. teachers, principals, us, none of us no are miracle bullets. workers. Exactly. And, you know, we wish we could go mm -hmm. and it would be all over with. But all else we can do is to strive to, to make sure that we're doing it. Yeah. See that we're doing it. The yeah. advancement. So for children who thought they couldn't, that now they think they can. That's right. That's Absolutely. right. Absolutely. That that's the big thing right there. Mm -hmm. If I if I see a child in elementary school and talk about college, and they're all excited, and then I see a co that same child in in middle school going, well, I can't afford to go to college. I'm not smart enough to go to college. I want that erased from a yeah. child's mind. Yeah. There's no excuse for any child to think that they cannot go to college. And or for that those they can't do math, right? Or that they can't read right. that right. book. That's and, right. that. and for those students who college just in, in their future for whatever reason exactly. to provide the other opportunities right. so that right. students right. can learn right. a skilled trade and good, be prepared so for the for workforce. Exactly. Right. exactly. So exactly. that they'll go Make out there and get a good earnable job. wage. Absolutely. That's right. right. Livable wage. All right. Now that we have sufficiently taken you off of your... <laughs> <laughs> and again, great things are always happening in Queen Anne's County Public Schools. Thank you, Ms. Thank Brown. you. All right, we're going to ask Mr. Farley to come forward. Um, we've had some great discussions tonight uh, with regard to student performance and, and teacher and principal evaluations related to student performance. Mr. Farley is going to talk to us about some of the policy work that we've been doing. We, as you know, have made a priority uh, of, around ensuring that our policies are appropriate and that we have regulations so that everyone knows how we will implement those policies. But of course, there has to be a structure and a format for that to happen. So uh, with that, Mr. Farley. The first one. This one? Mm -hmm. okay. And I'll just go through them. Okay. <clears throat> Good evening, board members, colleagues. <clears throat> I'm pleased to share with you a series of six documents which represent the policy and regulation process as you'll see it coming forward uh, beginning tonight with the introduction of the policy development policy and its implementing regulation. <clears throat> this is already posted to the web. It introduces what is a policy. It introduces the num numbering structure for the policies that will be posted to the web um, and how they're structured here, 100 series through the 700 series. What is a regulation? Um, and it describes them. It's quite simple. <clears throat> and then in the next Ooh, if I can get to it in the next document Ooh, bear with me please we have a flow chart <clears throat> which represents the <clears throat> I don't know if that's too small to see <clears throat> thank you it represents the series of steps the policies will go through as they're pro proposed by the um, policy committee and its calendar of policies through the HR director um, using the policy template and then numbered using the policy structure. <clears throat> Bear with me for a second. <clears throat> the primary position, let's say it's a, uh, a CNI related or instructional related policy would go through Mr. Paluski for information who would then develop the information item agenda template, which is always going to be seen as a cover to the introduction of any policy that comes before you. <clears throat> so he would do a summary. It would then go before the executive team for review and recommendation to the superintendent. If the superintendent does not recommend it, then we hit the brakes. Um, if she does recommend it, then the policy is sent forward to the board for information and it goes for the first read. Um, and also at the same time when it goes for the first read, uh, it would then be posted to the web for a 30-day policy review by the public. We have in our regulation who that public is, not only on our website, <clears throat> but stakeholder groups that are named in the regulation. <clears throat> Pardon me, I swallowed a frog. Um, so <clears throat> so um, <clears throat> then um, 
So when we say 30 days, we really mean 30 days. So there is not 30 days between today's meeting and the February meeting. And so we will wait until the next meeting in order to provide to you a summary of the feedback that we've received. And at that point, we will be prepared for uh, this HR summary of the feedback and we will present the policy for the second reading using the action item agenda template. These templates are always yellow when they're presented and you'll see that in a little bit when we present the actual policy for your consideration. At that point the board would approve the policy. Please note that this is a two read, not a three read process. And it's not to speed it along, but rather, you know, we're taking extra time. We're giving a full 30 days. We're soliciting additional comments by the community, actually engaging stakeholder groups in a very transparent process. So I want you to realize it's an effort um, to rebuild a thorough and comprehensive policy process. So if I can interrupt you for just one second. So for example, right now we put policies out and we rarely get a response, right? So we're going to be making sure that we put policies in front of select group, you know, selected groups. So the advisory council, superintendent advisory councils that we start this month, will be putting policies in front of them as they're appropriate um, so that we can get some feedback from folks. If it's good and, and they're okay with it, that's fine. But we want to make sure that we we really are getting feedback from from our public Absolutely. exactly good. so that people are actually taking yeah, a that's look. a good idea yeah so anyway that's the flow chart uh, the next piece in the in the journey down policy lane is bear with me please this information item agenda page uh, you'll see it's yellow it's an information item um, that's why there's an X by information it then says this is the first read uh, the pol you know, for a um, 30-day public comment period. This is a template, so this will be on every one of these information items. So that's one. Um, the next one is the action item agenda page. This says that the item is being presented um, by the superintendent subject to final correction for style and format. That means that the only changes that would be made would be stylistic or you know in terms of the way the policy is presented in format or if there's a minor uh, correction to be made uh, I would say that certain things that we have in our uh, archaeological collection of procedures look like policies but they're not policies they're actually procedures and those things we intend to treat like procedures so I just want to be really upfront about that with you uh, so in total, we collected 267 documents over the course of recent years, and we're working as a team uh, to redo those and introduce new ones. Um, and so I just wanted to be really honest, the things that are, that are pr actually procedures will be treated as procedures. So then we have the policy template. This, this is our standard template. And this is going to be put out in a, I call it a sandbox, because that's where we'll work on redeveloping all of these policies into the correct format, splitting policies, which are the board's domain for um, overarching you know, direction to the superintendent and to the body about what you wish from, and I'm going to move away from this now because this is pretty simple, to the regulation, which is an administrative regulation, the admin regulation template, um, which is really how the policy is to be implemented. And this is the domain of the superintendent. You give the superintendent that authority to implement the policy. So that's sort of it in a nutshell. Um, I'm going to be walking you through the implementation on the policy development policy in just a minute. Please uh, be tolerant of some of the silliness involved here, but it really is very important. And that's all I have to say about that. Thank you, Mr. Farley. Uh, certainly. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Landgraf with the monthly expenditure report. Okay. Um, once again, you have two expenditure reports. You have the report number one, which is the 30,000 foot level, and then the report number two, which is the 10,000 foot level. Um, if you look at report number two, 
Um, you will notice that we are now in a position in transportation um, uh, for our salaries that we are going to need to transfer money to that category um, next month. So, I what salaries? I'm sorry. Transportation. Uh, transportation, transportation for salaries. Okay. <clears throat> And this is what we've talked about the last couple months where mm -hmm. we've had special ed um, transportation right. that exceeded the budget. So we're going to be doing a deep dive trying to figure out what that number is going to come out to by the end of the school year and try to figure out where we're going to cover those um, salaries. Heating fuel, which has covered them the last couple of years, might not be an option this year mm -hmm. after the last 10 days that we've had. So um, we'll be looking at that and you'll get a transfer letter next month. Any questions? Is that the only category that we're in trouble on? <laughs> well, we're very early in the heating season, <laughs> which makes me very nervous to have had 10 days below um, freezing, you know, for such a long period of time. But other than that, yeah. And uh, Dr. Pearson is going to share the results of the budget survey that we had open for a few months, <laughs> the priorities from our public, and our employees were, of course, invited in to uh, respond to that survey as well. Okay. I'm Dr. Pearson, and we're going to go over the um, FY19 Budget Parent Community Member Survey, and the purpose of this was to gather information from a wide group of stakeholders regarding their priorities for the Queen Anne's County Public Schools operating budget. Prior to um, having the survey, there were community, um, I think like round tables or, or, talks or forums. Town halls, town halls. And uh, the attendance was not quite successful, so this was our effort into trying to get additional um, feedback as it relates to the budget. And the objective is just to share uh, the budget preferences of the stakeholders with the school board members and leadership and the general public. There were uh, 13 questions on the survey that was online. And the first question asked, as it relates to how many children was living in the household who attended Queen Anne's County Public Schools, there was 284 responses for this. We see that um, one child, there was 36.97 um, adults that responded that they had one child in the household, uh, two children 44.37 percent three ten point twenty one percent had three children uh, those who had four children were six point three six point thirty four percent uh, with five one point six percent seven point thirty five percent and eight point seven percent the second question was what level of school does the children or child attend we got 300 responses for that, and you can see the um, numbers there. Uh, the highest being elementary, 37.44%, middle, 30.93%, high school, 25.81%, a former student, 4.19%, uh, and students who had never attended, 1.63%. And something has happened to our graph there. Um, yeah, I was just going to say yeah. why. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know, in the transfer, <laughs> the presentation up. that we did earlier today had them in the right order, but that, that former student at 4.19%, that bar in right for that. <laughs> so, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll make sure we get that one fixed, get this graph fixed. Yeah, I think they're all kind of skewed because the, the, just the last one, one is like turning yeah. down. Uh, yeah. yeah, just they're the last right one is, is right. <laughs> So we'll, we'll, we'll fix that for you. <laughs> the percentages are accurate, but the bars are yeah. not. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah, the bar is not on this one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So when we look at um, uh, the, the numbers, the percentages are, are correct. I'm looking at another, the actual one from the, yeah, um, from the survey form, but the bars are incorrect. Uh, the next question, um, which was 
I would say one of the key questions on the survey, your input on the below priorities which inform the school system's process in formulating the 2018-2019 budget and to rank in order of importance of the following funding priorities with one being the most important and seven being the least important. And uh, the most important was high levels of acad uh, achievement, graduating college, <coughs> career and civic ready students, number two, small class sizes, three, competitive salaries to attract highly qualified teachers and staff, Technolo classroom technology, then textbooks, materials of instruction, renovation of or rebuilding aging facilities, and number seven, after school programs for remediation and or enrichment. So those were rank in the priority, one through seven with high levels of achievement being number one. The next question had 113 um, written responses. And these were a uh, theme. When we said 113 written responses, I think I provided copies of all of the responses yeah, um, to them. everyone. <laughs> we got so them. these are the themes from all 113 written responses. And the uh, number one theme for those, um, and I did the top five, and this is um, out of order too. I don't know what happened with the um, transfer of the slides, um, but some of the um, wording is out of sync here. But theme one is arts, theme two, special education services, theme three, professional development, especially with special ed and special education and technology. The fourth theme was increase of teacher salaries and the fifth theme was smaller class sizes, STEM and a support of the Family Center of Queen and County. So it looks like it's cut off, but that is kind of the, the top of it. I don't know what kind of, um, there was some, I guess, transfer from this when, to the other one. When you put it to PDF, sometimes it moves things. Okay. Over. It looks right on our computers, yeah. though. Okay. It, it, yeah, it's just up there. Those themes are in order of priority. Yes, theme one through five. Mm -hmm. uh, this one is to rate the quality of the following instructional programs, and we had 300 responses. And when you look at this, I highlighted in uh, yellow was the uh, average rating, which was the highest rating on a scale of one through five. One being excellent, and um, five being, I'm gonna make sure I say this right, unsatisfactory. So you have excellent, satisfactory, and unsatisfactory. So uh, world languages, and then for the second ones would be health and technology education. And here we go back to written responses, um, which would have referred to the previous question. If you rate a program as satisfactory or below, please explain, and there was 155 written responses and these were the five themes of those written responses. Uh, theme one, more pre-K services are needed. Theme two, world languages should be offered more often and at all levels. Uh, theme three, more science classes and learning opportunities in science. The fourth theme was more music classes are needed at all levels. And the fifth theme was more special education services needed and more mental health services. The next question asks to rank the following in relationship to instructional or uh, instruction materials. And this is the um, rated as it was the other ones, one being excellent, five being unsatisfactory. And this is in relationship to instruction materials. <coughs> and we have availability of textbooks or instructional material um, receiving 2.5 as well as academic intervention. And the next one on the scale would be the availability of laboratory equipment. And then you can see the other two that are listed in a lower average rating. The next one asks to rank as it relates to support services. There was 297 responses. And um, on that same scale, one being excellent, five being unsatisfactory, extended school day 2.5 and the next highest would be the extracurricular programs
Moving right along, ranking the following in relationship to supplemental programs. We had 300 responses for this particular one. And lunch program coming in at 2.4, being uh, ranking as uh, the highest on that scale. And then we have the breakfast program and school counseling services coming in next. Excuse me, what, was, um, what is the lunch program? How was it explained on there? You mean explain in the? In the survey. It, it just lists, it just lists, um, just like it's list here, and you just click <coughs> either you're rating your lunch program as excellent. Oh, okay, or okay, satisfactory okay. Satisfactory All right, I guess I, I was lost there. <laughs> Sorry mm -hmm. about that. Not a, not a service or benefit to what they serve in the cafeteria <laughs> and how they do it. <laughs> Okay, the next question, I didn't want to say that. Uh, please list any additional supplementary programs that you would like to offer <laughs> for Queen Anne's County and we had 81 written responses for that one. <coughs> and we had these in themes and the five themes are listed here, after school programs and transportation for after school programs. Theme two, STEM programs. Theme three, world languages, especially Spanish and Chinese. And you'll see that world languages come up a couple of times. So it's um, something that um, our public has great interest in. Um, theme four, arts. And theme five, athletics and physical education. The next one is to rate the following in relationship to school facility and grounds. And we had 299 responses for this one. Um, ranking the highest was the classroom space availability, classroom furniture, play, parking area, park drives, and sidewalks. And then you have three coming in um, right underneath there at the same level, state of repair, maintenance, school grounds, and playgrounds. And then you're rating um, the following for field course experiences, there were 296 responses for that. Community work experience is highlighted for 2.5, and then we have work study and tutorial internship coming behind it at 2.4. And then this is our last question. What, what are your priorities for our budget for the 2018-2019 school year, and there were 155 written responses, and these are the themes. Theme one, teacher salaries. Theme two, quality of teachers. Theme three, small class sizes. Theme four, updated Chromebooks. And theme five, repair buildings, facilities, update technology and arts programs. Um, I thought this, this was a very good way to capture um, responses from uh, the community and from the public. We got a lot of responses, as you can see. I think that um, surveys is a good tool um, to use, and hopefully we'll be looking at some additional survey options. This particular tool could not facilitate a whole lot. It's kind of quite antiquated, but um, we've been looking at some other um, survey programs so we could um, dive a little deeper and get more out of um, our surveys. But I thought that this was a great effort as relates to sharing what um, our community is saying as relates to the budget. Well, it was more than the people showing up. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and and all, all three members. meetings. <laughs> and you will enjoy reading um, the response. Yeah. We have. Oh, you have. Okay. <laughs> We've read, read some, some of them. Of them. <laughs> and, and thank you, Dr. Pearson. It's, um, you know, it's one, um, thing when we're looking at uh, quantitative and we're looking at numbers when we do surveys, it's difficult to then pull qualitative data out of these written responses and then come up with these themes. It's mm -hmm. not lost on me what a challenge that can be. So right. it was really um, helpful and insightful. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you very much. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Peterson. Okay. I think it's interesting the last, um, um, I'm sorry, the, um, the last slide about where we want to put our priorities. We've had those same yeah. priorities for several years in a row. Mm -hmm. Teachers, compensation, and small class sizes. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Well, even number five, repair buildings and yeah, that's, facilities. That's, that's our capital budget right, right. that 
lots of people like to ignore it's necessary interesting okay so it's time to take a break do you want to take a break or do we want to continue on ladies i'm okay going. i'm ready to keep on going you good i'm good. good we're good all right let's finish this up then okay so we are going to move on to uh the hr report may i have a motion to approve the hr report as presented so moved may i have a second second all in favor say aye aye, aye. all opposed say no the ayes have it transportation report Yes, good evening, board members. Um, we have uh, a substitute driver that has met all the criteria. Uh, Jackie Hutcherson would be the driver. And then also we need the approval for two new bus purchases for next year. Uh, Mr. Lawrence Wood, his bus will be at the end of this year, 15 years. So he needs to replace that bus. What and is also, his name? I'm sorry, Lawrence Wood, and that will okay. be bus 4904. And then the second bus is uh, Mr. Fred Bonds, uh, and that's bus 6606. His will be 14 years after this year. I make a motion that we approve the substitute bus driver, Jackie Hutchison. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. I have a question on Mr. Bonds. Um, is he from up county? I mean, 14, go to 15, right? I mean, you can. They have the option to go to 15. If they are experiencing uh, over $5,000 in maintenance fees and things like that, they have the option, <coughs> excuse me, to ask for that. Um, you, you can definitely tell when you see those two buses that they're starting to age. <laughs> so. And I make another motion um, to approve the new buses for Lawrence Wood and Fred Bonds. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. Thank you. So we have a policy for third and final read. Uh, may I have a motion to approve the following policy? Use of nac nac I never Nalox pronounce it. Naloxone. Naloxone or other overdose reversing medication policy number 519, Mr. Engel. Second. Any um, comments? Any more comments come in? We've received no feedback. We did post um, further amendments to the policies and, and the regulation in red uh, to better meet our obligations under the policy and the regulation. Have had no feedback whatsoever. Okay, so moved. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. Future action items. Policy for first read. Um, substance use policy number 527. It replaces the drug and alcohol policy upon final approval and policy development. Policy number 110 replaces current policy on policies. <laughs> <laughs> I'm confused, but anyhow. So may I have a motion to approve these policies? He just said he was going to walk us through this. Was oh, this where you were going to? The appropriate use pol or the appropriate use policy replaces a policy currently in existence. Some minor modifications, but right. that's one of those ones we're reformatting and okay. putting out. But the other one, if I may, I'd like to walk you through. Do you want me to walk up here or do it from where I'm sitting? It does. Okay. Whatever Pardon me? Works for you. Yes. Whatever works for you. Okay, great. Go ahead. So um, if we could, let's go to the policy development policy. You'll notice that the policy spells out the definitions of what a policy is, it, it, that it has to have the elements, purpose statement, definitions, uh, implementation, and expectations for evaluation, review, and update. We didn't always have that in the past, and so its, it's review was either unspecified or infrequent, and we're getting all of that built into our new policy uh, database or spreadsheet. Um, as well as the legal and policy references and the uh, effective date. Um, you'll notice as well that upon the first reading, the superintendent will present it and that it will go to groups. And we have A through F here, including the Multicultural Proficiency Committee, County PTA President, 
um, local management board were soliciting feedback, as Dr. Kane mentioned, trying to fire up the feedback process and get people, you know, in, you know, in the in the feedback mode. So we're not just doing what we just did, which is, you know, d moving through the motions. So. Uh, and then, again, it discusses a second read with, at which time the uh, policy becomes effective. That uh, the policy committee would put out an annual policy calendar in which we're prioritizing and putting out um, our goals for what policies are most important. Which ones don't we have but feel we need? Which ones are critical based on the legislative <coughs> uh, agenda that's coming up, et cetera? Just things like that. Is, so is this list of, of organizations you would send it and to? And then we'll move on to the... Um, Wait a minute. Hey, Mr. Farley, yes. we have a question from Captain Kelly. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. The list of uh, organizations you have here, um, it's, it's all inclusive or are they sort of... You said such as, so is, are you going to pick out the list to send it to based on... No, they're policy? listed there. Those are the places, those are the stakeholder groups that we propose to send it to. Um, and they will so still go out for public comment for yeah. the general public, but because we <coughs> rarely get comments, we want to make sure that we're putting them in front of certain groups, some groups. If you have a suggestion, do you have a suggestion no. for another group? No, I'm just okay. saying it'll change based on the policy you're sending forward. Absolutely. That, the, mm -hmm. that is affected. Okay. Mm -hmm. You just said input to such groups as, so mm -hmm. I didn't know if that was the, the Such uh, groups will be list. based on what the policy right. is. Mm -hmm. The community will still see all of it. As you, as it says, it's posted to the website as soon as it goes through first read. So that's, that's right up front, and uh, we hope we'll get more participation at that point. The regulation, um, which is also in your file, let's see. Bear with me one second. It doesn't specify who heads up the policy committee. It has three, one member of the board as designated by the board, but this is, this is soft. This is waiting for your input uh, and your named participation. Uh, so it's, it's still unfinished and needs your attention. Uh, it does specify uh, this assistant superintendent, the director of operations and the chief financial officer. Um, it describes how we're going to post in markup language using red and red strike through so that it's easy for you to recognize what's being changed about a policy from iteration to iteration. Um, we hope that all of this makes it easier for you as our board and that, um, and that any references to law are clear and that the pro policy becomes transparent to our stakeholder groups, to our community, and those who have to follow it. Um, do you have any questions for me? Okay, well then we got a lot of work to do. <laughs> <laughs> Quite a bit of work, right? Yes. Okay, so at this time we'll move on to citizen uh, participation public comment is there anyone um, here that did not speak earlier that would like to speak now I Darren was getting up. yeah I thought Darren was too <laughs> we thought you were getting ready to talk <laughs> <laughs> we, were we were just making sure you were still awake over there oh there you go okay I think we're supposed to vote on these no we're not no it's only it's going after the first read We have to ask for a motion for yeah, that. Yeah, we have to do that. We haven't. Yeah, we haven't done. Oh, that. we do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I make a motion. Oh, that okay. We I'm sorry. The I policies see you yeah. to go out to our stakeholders for the first read. First read. Second. Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, say no. The ayes have it. So at this time, does you anyone want to speak? <laughs> Don't you raise your hand there over there, Darren. <laughs> Um, so we're going to do future meetings and events. Um, the one thing that we um, we do, we're going to be changing is on January 17th, we will have a budget work session from 11 till 2 p.m. 
the budget work session for January 22nd will be canceled. That was to be a um, board retreat, and uh, we have decided to put that off. Uh, the next budget work section session will be on January 31st and on February 7th the superintendent's uh, recommended budget will be put forth cool. does anyone else have anything that they would like to discuss at this time I would like to add the February 20th uh, legislative luncheon for the an item for the board to consider. We know what time that is, Ben. Ten o'clock, I believe. I've got it marked. But Do you I know where it is? Time. Where is it? It's at at the state. I believe it's usually at the state house. I can get the, the definite okay. information on it. It's on Ma Mabe's That's website. Okay. And also, I believe we got an email in on that. Anything else, Mr. Maggio? I, I would, if you don't mind. Uh, one of the things that I just want to bring everybody's attention, uh, the superintendent and I uh, at our ANS meeting provide our leaders with updates. Uh, today is 128 that Dr. Kane has been our superintendent of schools, and I just want to appreciate her for her leadership. I love it. Thank you Thank very you, much, Kane. Greg. <laughs> Well, we will adjourn at this time. <laughs> Thank you. Have to tell I you make a motion when we close open session. I second. Second. Keep, All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it.